Thank you very much for the music ministry. And now let's uh, turn our Bibles. Uh, I'm going to have you turn, uh, let's start with the book of James. Let's go to the book of James, chapter 1. Uh, kind of in the back uh, part of the uh, New Testament, uh, certainly before the book of Revelation, which is the last book. And then uh, uh, you get uh, John and James, uh, Jude, John and James, uh, uh, prior to it. Uh, Peter, I should say, uh, and uh, James is being right in front of the book of Hebrews, uh, after the book of Hebrews, in front of the book of First Peter. Uh, but we continue to note our topic of study, which is Luke chapter 11, and we continue in uh, verses 1 through 4, which is that template prayer uh, that our Lord gave to the disciples and really to uh, all uh, the believers that were listening to him, especially in Matthew's account where he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. And in that, they asked, how should we pray? And Jesus Christ gave them instruction as to how to pray, not what to pray specifically, but how to pray. So we call this the template prayer of our Lord that is more famously known as the Our Father. And as you note, and I'll uh, continue to repeat this, that this is not a prayer to be repeated verbatim over and over and over again. And then actually in Matthew chapter 6, before this prayer template is given by our Lord, he says, don't pray repetitively as the Gentiles do, thinking that they're going to be heard for their many words. So we're not to do a repetitive or routine type of prayer over and over and over again, as unfortunately the Our Father is used in most denominations of Christianity uh, throughout our day. But this is a prayer that gives us guidelines as to the things that we should be praying for. And as you know, it's ex expanded a little bit in uh, the Gospel of Matthew compared to what Luke has given to us. But we are finding ourselves now in the last section of this template prayer, which is verse 4, uh, as we have up here on the board, where it says, And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And then this morning specifically, and lead us not into temptation. Temptation. And as you look at Matthew's gospel, it says the same thing, and lead us not into temptation, but Matthew also includes what our Lord said, but deliver us from evil. And there's actually some corrected Greek there, or a context that I'll be giving you in just a second. But that is what we have before us this morning, which we started on uh, Thursday, our last class that we were together. And there we understood that lead us not into temptation really doesn't mean what it says verbatim by these words. And the context of what we have and what we know when we compare Scripture with Scripture is not that we are asking God not to lead us into temptation because as we've studied and as we know, God is not tempted nor does he lead people into temptation. God does not, uh, is not tempted nor does he tempt people. So we can't ask God to lead us not into temptation because God doesn't lead us into temptation. He does not tempt. There is somebody who does tempt, and we're going to talk about that uh, towards the end of our uh, lesson this morning, and that is who Satan, the great tempter himself. But what this phrase actually means in the context of what we see, not only in Luke, but more importantly in Matthew's context, that adds that last part, but deliver us from the evil one, we really should be understanding this passage as, do not let us be carried away by temptation. You see, when you understand this uh, from a Greek sta uh, standpoint, in the context of what the rest of the scriptures tell us about this prayer, it is not, do not lead us into temptation temptation because God does not tempt. He does not lead us to temptation. But ultimately what God does is see us through the temptation as we get into temptation. And the prayer that we should be praying for is that we don't succumb to temptation. And as I said on Thursday, what's that all about? Well, in essence, when we enter into temptation, remember temptation by itself is not a sin. And we are tempted all the time, either by our sin nature or the world around us. We're tempted to sin constantly, day in and day out. So to ask not to be tempted wouldn't even be a good prayer, because we are tempted all the time, every day. And I'm sure as I speak to you for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, or 40 minutes, however long I go this morning, that you're going to be tempted to sin at least once, maybe twice, maybe five times, or more, while I am preaching and teaching this morning. That's just how it works. That's how the sin nature works. That's how uh, Satan's cosmic system works. So we know we aren't to pray not to be tempted. And we 
we know we should not pray for God not to lead us into temptation because God does not lead us to temptation. He does not tempt us. The great Satan does. He is the great tempter. What this is really talking about is when we enter into temptation, guide us there, deliver us from that, and lead us so that ultimately we don't give in to the temptation, which then becomes what? Sin within our lives. You see, that little uh, phrase there that is translated into is ice in the Greek, and it means going into the sphere of something. And the sphere of something here is what? Temptation. And you see, once you're in the sphere of temptation, the temptation of itself is not sin. But if you dwell in that sphere of the temptation, you massage that temptation in your mind a little bit. Think about it. Expand upon it. Think about what it means and how good it would be. And hmm, that wouldn't be too bad to do that thing. Or maybe I want to do this. Or maybe I want to do that with this then it ultimately becomes sin within your soul. It becomes a mental attitude sin that could then lead to a verbal sin or an overt sin as you act that thing out. So basically, this is not a prayer, do not lead us into temptation, but it's a prayer that should be said, or with the context of, do not let us be carried away by the temptation. Because when we're carried away by the temptation, then it becomes what? Sin within our lives. And then what does the second part in Matthew say? But deliver us from evil. And really it says from the evil one, being Satan himself. He is the great tempter. Deliver us from that. We know we're going to be tempted. We're not tempted by God. We're tempted by Satan. So we're asking God to deliver us from that. Deliver us from what? sin within our lives. Really, that's what this uh, passage is all about. It's not saying don't lead us into that temptation so that we don't have temptation because we're always going to have that within our lives. It's part of Satan's cosmic system, but it's more about carrying us through it so that we don't enter into sin, giving us the strength, giving us the fortitude, giving us the spiritual uh, means necessary to overcome the temptation so it does not become sin within our lives and deliver us from evil. That is really what it's all about so that we do not enter into sin. So this prayer ultimately is a temptation so that when the testing does come, and you see, as we talked about on Thursday as well, remember, God allows us to go uh, enter into temptation as he allowed Job to go into temptation, as he allowed his son Jesus Christ to go into temptation, as he allowed Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden to enter into temptation. You see, God allows that. He doesn't bring the temptation or lead us to that temptation because he does not tempt us, but he allows Satan to bring temptation into our lives. And when he allows that to happen, it means that we are being tested in that case. And the testing is, are we going to stay fervent and continue to apply the word of God in faith? Or are we going to be weak and give over to the sin that is so readily within our lives? So that's what this is all about. This is a prayer petition so that when the testing does come, as a result of the temptation that comes into your life, we are not overcome by it so that we commit the sin over and over and over again, or give in to the temptation and then ultimately sin. Again, succumbing to it and then causing us to sin. It is a petition with the desire that what? We are not helpless, that we are not hopeless, that we are not uh, defenseless to overcome the temptation within our lives. This is a prayer so that we have strength in temptation so we do not enter into sin. And we're asking for God's strength in that situation. That's why this is a prayer to God. Now, as I also shared with you going into the Greek a little bit, this is not a request in the imperative mood, as all the other requests in this prayer or template prayer are. This is what's called a subjunctive mood. And that means, uh, you know, it, there's a potential that this will happen within your life. But it's also coupled with a negative. So it's a subjunctive of prohibition that we don't want to enter into the sphere of temptation where it becomes sin within our lives. Therefore, we're asking for God's strength. We're asking for God's guidance to help us to overcome the temptation so we do not enter into sin. 
That's truly what this section of this prayer is all about. And that's why, again, unfortunately, all these you know, churches and uh, denominations you know, say verbatim over and over and over again, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. With all the other Our Fathers, and they have no knowledge of what they're saying at all. And actually what they're saying is counter to what the rest of the Word has to say, because God does not tempt us. So therefore, this is not a prayer that we should be saying verbatim or routinely, and it's not something that we should be doing mindless, as we know, because we should understand the full meaning behind this and the context behind it. And when we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we see what Jesus tells us to uh, in the other parts of the Scripture, what to be praying for, how to pray, and all of that, we then understand what this principle is all about. Give us the strength so that when temptation comes into our lives, Lives, we stand firm and we become overcomers. We don't give in to the temptation and we do not sin. And with the power of the Word of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit, we can stay strong and not give over to the temptation where we fall apart and ultimately enter into sin. And as I said, temptation is inevitable. Remember the, the movie Matrix? That's the sound of inevitability. I love that phrase, okay? That's the sound of inevitability. And that's what temptation is. It's inevitable within our lives. You all have an old sin nature. The thing that that old sin nature is designed to do is to tempt you to sin and get you to sin. And then once you enter into sin, hold you in that sin and hold you where the sin nature is leading your soul. That's what it's all about. That's what it's designed to do. And that's why we need the power of God's Word in our soul with the filling of the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome its temptations and its power within our soul. And if we don't stay filled with the Holy Spirit and if we don't keep the Word of God cycling through our soul, we're going to give over to the temptation time and time again. Now, the other aspect of our temptation is what? Satan himself, where he and his cosmic system are designed to do what? Tempt you away from your relationship with God, to tempt you into committing some form of sin, human good or evil, where your relationship with God is destroyed or set aside and hopefully becomes null and void. That's what Satan's cosmic system is all about. That's why Satan and all his uh, minions and all his uh, demonic forces are here working to lead us so that we don't have a good relationship with God. And they are trying to deceive us and falsify things so that maybe we think we're being okay, but truly we are not. And they try to tell us it's okay to sin. This is going to help you. This is going to solve your problem. It's going to cover up your problem. But truly it does not. You see, Satan's cosmic system is filled with falsehoods, lies. And that's what it's all about. Lie after lie after lie. Deception after deception after deception. And that's what temptation ultimately is. It's a deception in your life that what is right in front of you is going to be better than what you already have in your walk and in your relationship with God. That's what temptation is. A great system of deception trying to get you to do something that you think is going to be better for you when in fact it's going to be much, much worse for you. And it's certainly going to destroy your relationship with God. And then if your relationship with God gets destroyed, it's also that temptation will probably lead you to be doing things that are going to do what? Destroy your body and your physical health. Not only is it uh, designed to uh, destroy you spiritually, but also to destroy you physically as well. That's what temptation is all about. But it is inevitable. And ultimately it comes from one of those three sources, either from within, your old sin nature, or the other two from without. Satan's cosmic system, the world system that is designed to lead you away from a relationship with God. And then number three, Satan himself. And remember, as we studied the book of Ephesians chapter 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, which means other people. That's not the enemy out there. What our enemy is, what? All the world forces, the darknesses, the prince of the power of the air, all of Satan's cosmic system that has been designed to lead you away from your relationship with God. The spiritual forces of wickedness. 
You see, that Satan and all the other fallen angels that are still uh, you know, uh, being led by him, and ultimately the world system that they are influencing and trying to uh, persuade to lead the world away from a relationship with God, from knowing God and having a relationship with God. You see, those are the three sources of temptation in our lives. There are no other. And God is not a source of temptation. So again, he can't not lead us into temptation because he never leads us to temptation. So in any case, but God does use that temptation. As we saw in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the three temptations after he came out of the wilderness. As Job was tempted by Satan to ultimately try to get him to sin and, and, and walk away from his relationship with God. God allowed that, but used it what? As a testing. And that testing is good for our lives. As I said, uh, temptation is inevitable. But that doesn't mean it's bad for you either. It's bad for you when you give over to it and you enter into sin. But temptation is also good for you because it gives you an opportunity to do what? Exercise your physical, your spiritual, let me say that right, your spiritual muscles. And what are your spiritual muscles? The Word of God resident in your soul and the power and the filling of God the Holy Spirit. You see, when temptation comes, you have great opportunity to utilize the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to say no to the temptation and continue to go forward in the plan of God. That's why God said, pick up and put on the full armor of God so that we can withstand what? The flaming missiles of the evil one. Satan and his cosmic system, the temptations from within and from without. Which is also found in Ephesians 6, after it says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it is against what? The fallen angelic realm. That's our struggle. And also our own personal sin nature. And we need the full armor of God. And when we have the full armor of God, we can stand firm. And we are exercising our spiritual muscles. And God uses that temptation to prove the word and the strength of the word and the power of the word. And also the power of the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And God demonstrates to you the strength that the word of God has in your life. Especially with the faith that you have going forward. But he also uses it to reprove us as well. And what does reprove mean? Well, if we happen to fail, we learn from the failure. And as I said earlier this week, many times we don't learn from the successes in our life and the prosperity and ev- when everything's going well and everything's peachy keen. We don't learn from that, but we typically learn when we fail or when we, we have a difficulty of trials and tribulations within our lives. That's typically how we learn best. And so the reproving factor is there to reprove our faith because there may be avenues or areas in our life where we are weak in faith. And we don't trust in God. And so God allows the temptation to come from Satan and his cosmic system so that we can exercise our spiritual muscles and learn where we have weaknesses so that we can bone up in that area and get better and get stronger and have even greater faith in our life. And not only have greater faith, but have a greater relationship with our Lord God. You see, temptation is good in the fact that it helps you to grow spiritually. And so again, we ought to run from temptation and we should not ask, don't let us be tempted. First, it's inevitable. But second, it can be very good for you to go through temptation and learn and grow from it and go forward in God's plan for your life. And remember, this is not a prayer of an avoidance, but it's a prayer for what? Sustaining us through the process helping us to go through that temptation. Just as Jesus said as he came out of the wilderness, those three temptations that he went through, the first one, he went right to what? His physical needs. He was hungry. He was starving. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Now Satan said, hey, turn the stone into bread. Satisfy that need that you have. And you can do that because you're God. Go ahead and do that. And Jesus responded with what? The word of God. Man should not live by bread alone, but what proceeds, fr- but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus used the word of God and to, to do what? Withstand the temptation that came to him. He easily could have turned stone into bread. He's God. He could have done that. Could have satisfied his physical need. 
his want, his desire, and maybe his lust at that time. I need food. I'm hungry. He could have done it. But no, he trusted in God. And he relied upon God. And he wasn't going to be tempted by Satan in the cosmic system to enter into sin or to do some self-willful act. Instead, he trusted in God so that the temptation did not become sin within his soul and lead him away from his relationship with God. Unfortunately, when we look at the Garden of Eden and Adam and the woman, and we see the temptations that they went through, and oh, by the way, they were tempted in three ways too, just as Jesus was tempted in three ways. We're going to talk about that upcoming in just a minute. And the three ways that Adam and the woman were tempted were exactly in the same genre that Jesus was tempted when he came out of the wilderness. Yet they failed. Why? Because they didn't apply the word. They weren't strong in the word. And they didn't stay faithful in the word. And instead, they allowed their lustful desire to take over, even when they didn't have an old sin nature. They allowed the temptation to take root in their soul, and it led them to sin. And ultimately, what? Broke their relationship with God for a time. As you know, they rebounded and recovered when they uh, put on the skins that Jesus gave them in the garden. Uh, ultimately, a picture of his payment of the penalty for their sins through his sacrifice. But they failed in that event. Jesus did not. And Jesus demonstrated how we, too, cannot ultimately fail when we enter into temptation, but instead continue to be victorious. And that's why, again, uh, when we talk about this great temptation uh, that comes to us each and every day, as the second part of the prayer says in Matthew, and deliver us from evil. But yet, when we look at the Greek, there's a little article called ho in the Greek, which is the in the English. And when that is before the word evil, which is poneros, ultimately it means the evil one. But it is that greater context of the evil one. And it talks about Satan and his cosmic system, which includes your old sin nature, because you have an old sin nature because Satan brought sin into the world as he brought sin into the angelic race. And so that, too, is part of what? The evil one. As Satan is the corporate head and the leader of all evil. So deliver us from the evil one is what we ought to be praying for. We don't want to enter into sin. We don't want to give over to the temptation. We don't want to dwell in this sphere of temptation too long. And that's what's really in view in the first part. Don't dwell in the sphere of temptation. Because if you stay there long enough, you're going to ultimately sin. And that's like, uh, you know, sometimes when you're out there in the world, okay? And you could be in a place where you enter into and you're filled with the Spirit and you've got the Word of God going and there's sin going on all around you. And at first you can be good about it and I'm not going to enter into their sin and I'm not going to do what they're going to do. But then eventually if you linger too long, what do you do? You then, oh, that looks fun. Oh, that looks great. Oh, they're having such a good time. Oh, let me do that too. And before you know it, you have entered into the sin that they've entered into. Why? Because you lingered too long. You see, sometimes you've got to get out of there. And the best thing to do is get out of there. If you can't mentally withstand the temptation, then get away from the temptation. Get out of that place and get away from those people because they're just going to drag you down. And sometimes we have to lose family, we have to lose friends, we have to lose association. Why? Because they're dragging us down. And they're not allowing us to live the spiritual life. Or, or, or I should say it this way, we're not allowing ourselves to live the spiritual life because we want to live like they are living, which ultimately is in sin, giving over to temp temptation. Sometimes you've got to remove yourself and set aside. So in any case, that's the prayer. Don't let us linger in temptation where it becomes sin, but deliver us from that evil. Give us the power. Give us the strength which God promised. So he's given you the word. He's given you your, the Holy Spirit. You just need to apply those things. And the Greek word for temptation, as I, I, I have up on the board, periosmos, as we've seen in our passage, was also the same word in regard to the temptation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Same word. So we know we're talking about the same thing. The same aspects where Satan tempted Jesus when he came out of the wilderness are the same aspects that Satan tempts us each and every day, whether it be from our sin nature, his cosmic system, or him directly. But yet, Jesus was victorious, as we know in Luke chapter 4, verse 13. He was victorious. Why? 
Because he stayed filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit led him to do what? Apply the Word of God. And in all three responses to the temptations that Satan gave to Jesus, he did what? Quoted Scripture. Quoted Scripture. Used the power of the Word of God. And even when Satan came back with him and threw Scripture at him to tempt him, Satan twisted that Scripture. But Jesus knew Scripture even better, and ultimately, just as you should know Scripture even better than the way Satan tries to twist it in this world, and ultimately Jesus said, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but there's other Scripture that tells me I shouldn't do what you're asking me to do. He compared Scripture with Scripture. So again, don't let the dominion of darkness that disguises itself as an angel of light sometimes deceive you even in that realm. Because sometimes Satan will even try to throw the word of God at you to get you away from your relationship with God himself. And that's the, 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 the trickiness of uh, the tempter. And that's the great scheme that he tries to put out there, the great facade that he tries to throw at you, even sometimes taking Scripture. But the fact is, our Lord went through it victoriously with the Word or with the Holy Spirit. Just as you can be victorious over any temptation that comes into your life with the Word and with the Spirit. And the reason that Jesus Christ also went through that is so that He could help us as we go through the temptation. And that's what this prayer is all about in Luke chapter 11, verse 4. Not, do not lead us into temptation, but don't let us be carried away by the temptation so that we enter into sin, but instead deliver us from the evil one. You see, in Hebrews 4, 5, it says, we do not have a high priest, and that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. And again, that's the weakness of our sin nature, the lust patterns of our soul, and we all have them. I've got weaknesses in my old sin nature where there are certain sins that I get tripped up on time and time again. And I try not to, and I fight against it. And every time that temptation comes, I fight, I fight, I fight. And many times I'm victorious, but every now and again, there it goes. And then you're like, oh, should have had a V8. No, just kidding. All right? But you're like, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Okay? And you all have that. And again, we all have that weakness within our life. Okay? And it's part of who we are. It's part of our nature called the old sin nature. Okay, But it doesn't have to be victorious in our lives because we have the word and the power to overcome those things. And whatever that thing is, it can be overcome and is overcome by Jesus, by his paying for our sins at the cross, giving us the way of escape, first through 1 John 1, 9, if we do enter into sin, but then giving us his word and his spirit so that we can say no to further temptation and stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Because he knows Jesus took on humanity to know the weakness that you and I have. And he knows all of our weaknesses. Again, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And Jesus proved to us that we can go without falling into the temptation. We can go without giving over to the, the weakness of our soul. We can do it with the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit. And again, we ourselves can't do it. We can't overcome it by ourselves. Usually when we try to do it ourselves, that's when we're failing and we t typically are giving in. But with God and His Spirit inside of us, utilizing that in faith, we can overcome any temptation that comes into our lives. We just have to let God work. We just have to faith rest in Him and trust in Him. And we have to recognize the temptation for what it is. It's part of Satan and his cosmic system that's just trying to get us away from our relationship with God. It's really what it's all about. Recognize it is what it is and then throw it out. Because the Word of God says. Yet he went without sinning. And when we look to God for our strength and power, we can endure any temptation and we can overcome any temptation that enters into our soul. And remember, the temptation in and of itself does not become sin. Jesus had to think about what Satan said to him, which was the temptation. He thought about it. But as soon as he thought about it, he also said, but the Word of God says. And he applied that. And then the temptation went away. He didn't linger 
on the temptation. He didn't massage it within the mentality of his soul, letting it grow and build. And, oh, let me think about this. And, oh, let me think about that. And he didn't let it go forward. Instead, he applied the word right away and said, no, I know what this thing is. And I'm not entering into it because it will lead me away from my relationship with God. And so again, he can help us with, uh, to overcome it. He causes the temptation to result also in a strengthening rather than a weakening within our soul. And that's what first, uh, excuse me, now the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. Let's turn there within our Bibles. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. And this is our attitude. This is kind of funny. Consider it all joy. Okay? Do you consider it all joy? When you encounter various trials? When you have trials and tribulations or temptations in your life, are you the yippee? Okay? <laughs> Yahoo! I can't wait. This is so fun. Okay? Maybe you should. Okay? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And that's our word there, periosmos. So again, temptations. Knowing that the testing, that's a different Greek word, but ultimately knowing that it's now coming from God, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You see, the temptation comes from Satan, but the testing is what God is now watching for, to seeing that you will endure in faith. Now in verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect result. Again, let it mature you. That word perfect result means let it work in your life so that you grow to spiritual maturity rather than being an infant believer that gives over to sin time and time again. Let it have its perfect, uh, 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 its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then verse 5, but if in anything, uh, but if in, uh, excuse me, but if any of you lacks wisdom, Again, which is Bible doctrine, the knowledge to overcome the temptation. Let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded, uh, being an, a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. And you have a high position. You're a royal priest. You're a royal ambassador. And you have God inside of you. You have a very high position. And in that high position with God in you as a royal priest and a royal ambassador, you are in more authority than temptation to sin. Think about that. You are in more authority than temptation to sin. And you have more authority in you. In other words, you don't have to give in to the sin, people. Okay? You don't have to give in to it. You can say no. And you have authority to do that. You've got power to do that. And you've got strength to do that. And when you do, as our Lord promises in James chapter 1, verse 12, let's read that. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, periosmos, for once he has been approved, and again, gone through that testing, he will receive what? The crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, there's a crown waiting for you in the eternal state. And when you can say time and time again, no to temptation, no to temptation, and continue to walk predominantly in the plan of God with the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit, not being sidetracked by the temptation of sin, there's a crown waiting for you. And it's called the crown of life. And it's one of those four crowns that we've studied in the past that God has available for the believer in the eternal state. And this is the crown of life because you have lived the spiritual life with God and the Holy Spirit, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working within you. You've lived the spiritual life because you've said no to temptation predominantly in your life. And again, we're all going to have slip-ups. We're all going to have faults and failures. We're going to trip up from time and time again. But what are you doing with the majority of your life? Are you an overcomer because of the Word and the Holy Spirit? If yes, you're going to get the crown of life when you get to the eternal state. 
You see, Jesus was tempted in all ways that we are so that he could come to our rescue, so that he could save us and uh, be there for us, especially when we ask of him, as it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Remember, we just read, Jesus has been tempted in all ways, but yet he demonstrated how to overcome that. Now Jesus also has been tempted. It says, for since, for since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. And again, all the things that Jesus went through. And what is the end of, uh, I think it's the book of John, at the very end of it, it says, you know, or, or towards the end of it, just the second to last chapter. It says there are many more things that Jesus did and went through that if we had all the books in the world, we could not fill them up. Oh, excuse me, we would fill them up, and then still there'd be more things that Jesus did. Okay? So in other words, you know, what we read in the Bible about Jesus' trials and tribulations, and we read about wandering in the wilderness and then being tempted three times, we think, oh, that's it. That's all he went through. No. He went through much, much more that is not recorded for us in Scripture. But we do understand from other Scriptures like this one that he's been tempted in that in which he suffered, in all ways that we have been tempted. But why did he go through that? Not only to get to the cross so that he could pay for our sins, but so he could come to our when we ourselves are tempted. And so again, the authority that you have within your soul. When you're tempted, are you there all by yourself? Are you there to fend for yourself? And, you know, you've got to figure out how to defeat this temptation. How am I going to overcome it? You see, when we think that way, typically we choose the wrong path. And we'll, you know, look at drugs and alcohol, or we'll look at uh, any other kind of uh, pleasures out there in life to overcome whatever pain or hurt or feeling we're having, you know, uh, to, to mask the pain. And we don't realize that we're not standing alone. We're never alone. You see, Jesus is always with us. And he's gone through the temptation so that he could totally understand what we're going through. As God, he already does. But now as the physical human being and seeing how the body earns and uh, churns and yearns. Okay. And feeling that himself, feeling the pull toward sin. Again, I'm sure you feel it. I mean, I, I feel it. Okay. When there's something, you know, going on that's sinful, you kind of feel that, especially as a Christian. And it's funny, you know, and uh, people have commented uh, uh, in the past, in my past life, about, you look like a very conflicted individual, <laughs> okay? And I said, yeah, you know what, you're right, I am. You see, the unbeliever is not conflicted because, you know, they could enter into the sin or not enter into the sin. It really doesn't matter because why? They're always in sin. It's not a big deal. Satan's really not pulling. But for the believer, when you're operating in righteousness, and you're, you see a sin uh, that's going on around you that you could enter into. Hey, it looks like fun. Maybe I could do that thing. You feel this pull, okay? You feel that pull within your soul. And you kind of almost want to walk over in that way. But then you go, oh, wait a minute. No, I got to stay over here. That's the conflict that we all have. And again, we're not fending for ourselves in that situation. Even though we feel that pull, all we've got to do is say, Jesus, help me. God, help me. And let the Word and the Holy Spirit come into your life. And if you have sinned, confess that sin quick. Now the Holy Spirit is there. You have the light of God, the fellowship with God. You've got the Word of God. And say, help me in this situation so that I don't go astray into that sin. You see, every temptation by Satan, as we understand, and this is, uh, we'll wrap up this morning. Uh, got a few more slides, so don't, get, don't close up your books yet. Okay. But in any case, got a few more things. But we'll uh, also pick this up on uh, Tuesday, our next service. But every temptation by Satan falls into one of the three categories that we saw Jesus being tempted. And all of them are designed so that we operate what? Independently of God. We operate on ourselves. We operate by our sin nature. We try to solve our problems or mask our problems or overcome our problems by ourselves. And Satan wants us to be self-assertive and self-determining. You see, that's what Satan is desiring in our lives. He says, you don't need God. And isn't that the great temptation back in the Garden of Eden? You don't need God. 
Oh, you can have the same knowledge that God has. Just eat that fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, and God's trying to hide something from you. He doesn't want you to know the things that he knows. He doesn't want you to eat from that fruit. He doesn't want you to know the things he knows. He doesn't want you to be like him. But if you eat it, you're going to have knowledge. You're going to have power. You're going to be just like God. You're going to be God yourself. And the temptation was there. And Adam and the woman were tempted to say, let me go get this thing for myself. Let me go get this fruit and I eat it. And I have this knowledge. I have this power. I am like God. And self-determinant. God said, don't do it. There's only one thing they couldn't do was eat from that fruit. Don't do it. No, I'm going to do it anyway because I want to. And they gave in to the temptations of Satan. Let's turn to our Bibles to uh, Proverbs chapter 14. Let's go to Proverbs 14. Again, kind of the middle of the Bible. After the book of Psalms. In Proverbs uh, uh, chapter 14. And we look at verses uh, 12 through 18. In uh, Proverbs 14, 12 through 18, it says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Again, sin. Even in laughter, the heart may be in pain. In the end of joy may be grief. The backslide, in, in other words, you know, yeah, you can be having all kinds of happy, fun stuff in the world, but ultimately it's detrimental for your well-being, both physically and spiritually. In verse 14, the backslider in heart, Again, the sinner in heart will have his fill of his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied with his. The naive believes everything, but the prudent man considers his steps. You see, the naive just, oh, Satan says this, oh, temptation says this, oh, I'm going to go, the world says this, oh, I'm just going to go do that. But the prudent man considers his steps. A wise man is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is arrogant and careless. What's arrogant mean? Self-determined, self-asserting. I'm going to do it because I want to. That's the foolish man. And then uh, verse 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Now in verse 18, the naive inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. Notice the crown there again, the crown of life, crown of knowledge. Again, you have the crown of Bible doctrine in your soul that you can apply to the situation. Also up on the board in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Again, the self-determined, self-assertive. We all have done that. We all continue to do that. Again, we've got to minimize that, okay? But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That's why he went to the cross. He took on our sins. So even when we are self-determinate and we are arrogant and we choose our own way, which really isn't our, our way, it's really Satan's way, okay? We think it's our way, and that's the great deception that he's put to us, but it's really his way. Again, Jesus has paid for that sin. And he wants us to then not only confess that sin, but then rely upon him and his word, so that we don't enter into further temptation and further sin. You see, Satan used all three of these categories, as we're going to see in regard to Jesus Christ, as I said, to Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden. And some of you uh, uh, have seen this before. I'm going to show you what these specific things are in just a minute. But these are also found. Let's turn to 1 John. Again, going back to the uh, back uh, back part of the New Testament. Let's go to 1 John just so you can see it for yourself. And I love it because there's no coincidence that we have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That goes along with the first part of Luke chapter 11, verse 4, in forgive us our sins. Okay, Those two passages uh, 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 align. And now in chapter 2, in verse 16, we see the last part of verse 4 of Luke 11. Again, don't let us be carried away by temptation. Because Satan has three systems of temptation that he continues to use on us today. 
And those three uh, systems, I, I like uh, to classify them, as I'll show you in a minute. But we see, and I have it on the board, but uh, you can read along as well. In 1 John 2.16, it says, For all that is in the world, what's the world? Satan's cosmic system. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And again, the world is Satan and his cosmic system. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. I like to call these three things appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride. Satan tries to build an appetite. I want this thing. I need this thing. I have a desire for this thing. Beauty, oh, there's something out there that can satisfy that need or that lust that I'm having. And then ambitious pride, oh, I think I deserve that. I'm going to go do that. And I'm just going to go out and get it. And then the temptation has come to completion of fruition and now has become sin. In the chart I have for you here, you see the three aspects of appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride. And in the Garden of Eden, what did Satan say to the woman in Adam? The tree was good for food. Oh, this is good for you. He created what? An appetite. In Jesus, what did he say? Command the stone to become bread. Jesus literally had an appetite. Okay? He was hungry. But he parlayed in the temptation that appetite. And then we call that the lust of the flesh. The physical body, the physical nature. The lust of the flesh. And really, that's talking about the sin nature. Creating that appetite inside of you. The temptation from within. And then the second category, beauty. Satan said to Adam and the woman in the garden, it was pleasant to the eye. Look at that fruit over there. That can give you everything you want. He's created the appetite and he said, that thing over there, that beautiful fu fruit over there, that's going to do it for you. As Satan also tempted Jesus, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And again, the kingdoms of the world today, most of them are beautiful. In the ancient days, the big castles and the ornate gardens that they used to have, absolutely gorgeous. Satan said, look at all that. I'll give it to you right now. Again, I'll give you all this beauty. And then what does it say in 1 John 2.16, the temptation against us, the lust of the eyes. There's something out there that I can see. And again, we could even add, include taste, touch, or feel, any of the sensory perception or even hear that's going to satisfy this lustful desire that I currently have. And then there's the ambitious pride. And Satan said to them, the tree was desirable to make one wise. This can give you the knowledge of God. You can be like God. So again, you can be wise. And then when he tempted Jesus, throw yourself off of this high pinnacle. What was he saying? You're God. And the rest of the story in that temptation is God's word says he won't allow you to be hurt. The angels will come and protect you. So throw yourself off. This you're God. Again, he was trying to parlay Jesus' arrogance as being God in that situation as well. Throw yourself off of this place. And then that's the boastful pride of life. Again, what I think I deserve, what I think I should have. And again, that's the arrogance that takes over our soul from our temptation. You see, there's one thing to be tempted, but then to parlay that temptation or to dwell in that temptation and then come to the, a, a, pl a, a place of massaging it so much that now you say, you know what, I'm just going to go and do that. For whatever reason, I either want that or I need that or I deserve that or whatever else, we've convinced ourselves. And even though we know it's going to lead us away from our relationship with God and lead us into sin, we say, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. So these are the three great categories of temptation that Satan used for the original sin, trying to get Jesus to sin, and then as it tells us here, trying to get you and I to sin. And Satan uses the same tactics, and I believe he used these same tactics to get the angels to fall as well in the great rebellion against God, where we know one-third of them stayed in rebellion and are called the fallen angels today. Same tactics. Let me create an appetite. Let me show you something that can sa satisfy that appetite. Let me give you a, a mentality that says, I'm going to go and do that thing for whatever reason. I'm going to do it. It's all Satan. It's all part of the temptation. And, you know, let me just go back. Many of us fail at the appetite. We get the appetite. We say, all right, I'm going to do it. Okay. 
Oh, there's something out there that can satisfy that? Okay, I'll do that. Okay? And then go all the way to the ambitious pride. Okay? Again, he keeps working. He keeps working. He, wor- he tried to work Jesus over, didn't he? Tried once, twice, thrice. Tried to work him over. He did it with Adam and the woman in the garden, too. Once, twice, thrice. And at the third time, they gave in. But at the third time, Jesus did not give in. And in the first, second, or third time, you don't have to give in either. And you can say no to whatever that temptation is that will lead you astray. And just say no. And call out to God for help. Jesus knows. Jesus knows your problem. He knows your difficulty. He's experienced your problem. He's experienced your difficulty. And the great tempter himself, Satan, he tried to tempt our Lord, satisfy his own problems. He tried to do it to our Lord in a unique way. Use your own deity. He says, yeah, I know you're a man and you're hungry right now, but use your deified powers. I know you're God. And the angels will protect you. Throw yourself off and call upon your royalty as God. So they will protect you. So to Jesus, there was even more than just the humanity. He went even beyond in aspects that we can't understand. He he was God too, and Satan was even trying to tempt him as God. But as we know, God can't be tempted. But what was he trying to do? Get Jesus to rely upon himself rather than replying upon the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. He's trying to get him to do that, just as he does for you and I as well. He tries to get you to rely upon yourself, to solve your problems, to satisfy your lusts, to go out and get what you think you need. You see, that's what it's all about. And so when we understand the enemy, we can better resist and defeat the enemy. And so now we understand what temptation is all about. And we can overcome it, and we can defeat it. And so therefore, Satan does not have to win. You see, we don't have to use our own human resources, our own human power, and our abilities. Okay, We trust in God. We rely upon God. And we faith rest in God. And we use those problem-solving devices coupled with the Word of God. And we rely upon Him, His Spirit, His Word, rather than relying upon ourselves. And when we do that, we will be victorious. But when we try to fend for ourselves, that's typically when we are defeated. And we'll give over to that sin each and every time. But yet God has given us all the strength, all the power, all the ability all the resources necessary to say no to any temptation, trials, tribulations, whatever the case may be, and all the appetites, beauty, and ambitious pride that Satan tries to throw at us so that we can say no to sin and continue to walk in fellowship and inside the plan of God. But the point is, what do we have to do? We have to rely upon God, and we do that in faith. All right, let's close in, uh, in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us uh, the great power and ability and resources to overcome any temptation that may come our way. And Father, you know what our weaknesses are, and we ask that you help us to fortify especially those areas of our weakness so that we don't give in to them and ultimately sin, where we cause harm to ourselves, possibly harm to other people, and also have egregious acts against you. Because every sin that we do commit, Father, we know is sin against you. So, Father, we ask that you lead us to have power and strength to overcome, to walk in your will and plan more and more each and every day as we glorify you, serving each other. So, Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's precious name, amen.